recording in progress. So welcome to Conversations in Science, hosted by the Buffalo Museum of Science. Uh, my name is Gabrielle Graham, and I am the Community Partnerships and Adult Programs Manager at the Buffalo Museum of Science. This presentation is being recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, where we, can, where we maintain a playlist of past conversations in science. During the program, we do ask that everyone remain on mute so that we can preserve the sound quality for the recording. If you would like to ask questions throughout the program, please use the chat function. Um, you should see that on the very bottom of your screen. There's a little speech bubble, um, and I'll type a message in here. So if you use the chat, um, you can go ahead and ask your questions throughout the program and it won't interrupt the flow of the presentation. I will relay those questions to our presenters. Um, and then if you would like to verbally ask a question, if you use the raise hand function to uh, raise your hand and then I can call on you and ask you to unmute yourself. So feel free to ask questions throughout the program and I'll relay those as is kind of natural fits in the conversation. Uh, and with that kind of housekeeping, um, we will get into the introductions for our program. So originally the conversations in science programs were held at the museum with conversations at the end, uh, but we're very pleased to be able to bring this virtual version to you all today. This has really expanded our reach in a way that I mean, given with today's attendance, the, the response has been tremendous. We would like to thank RP Oak Hill Building Company for their continued support for and presenting sponsorship for Conversations in Science. And it is the support of sponsors, donors, and our members that enables us to continue our mission and to serve our community. So with that, I am officially going to hand this over to Larry and to Mo. Uh, Larry and Mo are both volunteers in our entomology collection, so they are working with our bugs and arachnids also fall under that section. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it over and who would like to speak first? Larry, do you want to introduce yourself first? Uh, Mo will start off. We'll, we'll go to Mo first. All Mo. right. Sure. Hi, my name is Marisha. Um, I go by Mo. I'm a volunteer entomologist at the Buffalo Science Museum. I've been doing entomology for 20 years. I started out the Smithsonian and then um, just been working in the lab curating an entomology collection. So insects are my entire life. I'm obsessed with them. So it's just a great joy to be able to do this. Larry? Yeah, I'm Larry. Uh, that's Mo. Curly couldn't show up today. So, you know, we, we got to go with what we've got here. But anyway, we've got, uh, I've been volunteering here at the museum for almost two years now. Uh, since I've retired and I'm loving every minute of it. I'm finally doing something uh, that I've been wanting to do for years and that's continuing working with bugs and insects. So, um, you know, when we were asked to do this particular project, it was a, a great honor for us to do that. Mo can attest to that too. And um, so we're here to answer any of your questions, enlighten you on cicadas, and just insects in general, um, but cicadas in particular, and how amazing they are. And at this point, I really just want to break in also and say that the different paths that each of you have in coming to work in the entomology collections are great examples of the variety of ways that you can get into science. Um, I know Larry has had a lifelong passion um, from the naturalist perspective and Mo has gone through academic training in this, but really there are a lot of different ways that you can come into having possession of this knowledge. And by having this program today, we're hoping to share some of that with you all so that maybe you can spark your own entomology journey. All right, so uh, how I'm gonna now step back again and remove the spotlight from myself and I will hand it over to you. Larry? Yeah. Well, uh, Mo, you want to start, why don't you start it off giving a general description of um, what cicadas are. Yeah. And um, in particular, what they're not. 
a lot of people confuse cicadas for locust, but this is what a locust looks like. Um, it's a large one, not found around here, but um, this is actually, this one is actually from South America, somewhere in South America. But um, uh, that is one of the confusing things about cicadas and and uh, locusts in general. A lot of people confuse it. But Mo, explain to them what a cicada is. <laughs> so cicadas, there's a really weird saying that entomologists have that all bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. And that's because cicadas are part of a group of insects called heteroptera. So hemipterans, um, they're true bugs. So um, they have a sucking mouth part. They're, they go through incomplete metamorphosis. Um, they're really neat. Insects have six legs, two pairs of wings, antenna, except for flies, two wings. Um, we're going to go over the 17-year cicadas. So they're completely different than other cicadas. We have um, what people call dog day cicadas, um, annual cicadas. They come out every year. You'll see them. They're rather large. They're green and brown. Um, they can be modeled black and white. They're very beautiful. They're very large. You would definitely notice them. But when they come out, they're not in very large numbers. Um, very small. Most people, you might hear one or two, but you really won't even notice them out in the summer. 17 years, however, they come out in the billions, <laughs> billions and billions. And these are completely different looking than the other ones. These are black. They have bright orange eyes. Their wings have... Um, like orange veins on them. They're very distinct. They're also considerably smaller, but even though they're smaller, you definitely notice them when they come out in just the billions and billions and billions. Um, Larry has some, do you wanna show them? Sure. The we have these. So this year, the 17 years that came out were um, two different species in the area. So we have the Magisticata piscinis and then the Septiceums, the Pessums. Um, Larry will show them to you. And if you would like to see the specimens larger, if you click on the view option on the top right of your interface um, and then select speaker view and you'll get to see a much larger picture than um, if you're looking at all the window boxes in gallery view. Yeah. Oh, maybe. Now, where is, is it? it? Working? Yes. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. All right, people. This is my first time using a Zoom uh, camera here, so just bear with me. Um, you can see the wings, so they're orange. But can you? Um, who's talking? If hey, anybody guys? can see that. Anyway, whose phone is that? <laughs> okay, you're good. Do you want to talk about the biology, Larry? Sure. Sure. This particular guy. This is um, actually, uh, Mo, you're going to have to talk about this too, because these are some specimens that uh, Mo just recently got when she was uh, visiting her mother down in Virginia. I don't think that was <laughs> the main reason she was going down there, though. Uh, I did. So I'm, I'm horribly obsessed with insects, as I said, and everybody knows Facebook. So we knew that these were coming out. Um, and I posted on Facebook, if anybody sees them, please, please let me know. Um, and a very dear friend of mine who I haven't seen in 30 years posted a picture on his Facebook about he had tons of these in his yard. And so I sent him a quick message and asked if I could come down and collect them. And he invited me down. And so I went down and grabbed my mom who lives nearby. And her and I went to go collect cicadas in the pouring rain. <laughs> she wasn't very happy after about 10 minutes. And she helped me load some into the car and she looked for some and my mother was great. She's always supported me. So she came in the rain and collected these cicadas for me. So it was, it was a really good time. I got to see an old friend. So it was, it was a good time, but that's where all these came from. But anyway, the, the, this species here that she collected, this is the, um, the genus is Magic Cicada. Those are the guys that are the um, uh, periodical uh, cicadas. And I don't mean magazines. These are the ones that come out every typically 13 to 17 years. Um, like Mo was saying before, you can tell by the orange stripes on the uh, uh, on the wings. I don't know if you can see it here, right there. I got to get used to this here, guys, because this screen. If I want to go left, I have to go right on the image. Here, I know. So it's, yeah. it's like steering a boat. <laughs> yeah, but that orange. Uh, uh, 
stripe you see on the, on the wing. So that's uh, kind of indicates what that is a major cicada. Now, just to show you a different one, hang on a second here. Has anyone in uh, that's in our attendance, have you gone out and collected cicadas before? If you want to let us know if you've ever picked one up, um, either from just the grass or a shell on a tree. Um, that's something that I always love to do. But this guy here, this is the, um, this is a cicada. This is uh, the cicadas that you typically find around Buffalo, Western New York, and uh, pretty much a lot of other places too. But this is the annual cicada or what we call the dog day cicada. Um, the difference being, you can see that, well, one of the differences is that it's mostly green and black. And the orange stripe that you saw in the major cicada, these guys here, and I'm not, without getting too technical, it's neotobison uh, lineae. These are the, the annual um, cicadas that we see around Buffalo. And you can see the difference in them. Big oh, difference. that one's much brighter. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And what's weird is you barely notice the giant ones, but you notice the tiny ones because they're just so loud and just in such high numbers. Yeah, people really don't, real when they think of cicadas, people don't realize that we have much larger cicadas. They just don't realize. Larry, where'd you go? I'm here. Okay. <laughs> I gotta switch back from the camera to the Zoom. I know. Do you wanna talk about how they communicate? Oh, sure. Yeah, they, well, typically um, what happens is when, when uh, males want to communicate with the females, and that's their whole purpose in life, and, um, you know, I think, Mo, I think you, you said you, you're going to go over the developmental stages in that. But when they come out of the ground and you have these giant broods like this, I mean, there are liter literally billions of these that come out in one brood. And um, their main purpose, after they've been underground for 17 years, their main purpose is to mate. Then... After they mate, you know, the females will lay the eggs. After about, you know, three, four, six weeks, they die. <laughs> and that's it. And, uh, but, the, but the eggs will develop and, uh, you know, the, form uh, uh, the nymphal stages. And then when the immatures will fall down off of the tree branches that they're typically uh, developing on, they'll fall down to the ground, dig underground and begin the 17 year cycle all over again. <clears throat> so that's what makes it amazing here. But Mo, to answer your question here, how do they communicate? Well, typically it's the males that make all the loud noises that you hear. And, and it can be extremely loud. Um, one, in, in all the males, uh, male cicadas, they have this organ uh, in their bodies. There's one on either side. They're called a, a, a tympanum, uh, a timbles. I'm sorry, they're called timbles. And the timbles are vibrated by the um, little muscles inside their bodies. And they vibrate so fast that they produce a sound like that. And also the abdomen of most male cicadas are hollow, which amplifies the sound even more uh, than you know you can imagine. Um, that that we, word timbles reminds me of um, an orchestral term, the tympanum, which is the yeah. very large kettle drum. I think there's a, a right. common thread in our language there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of the um, a lot of the terminology used in sciences in general come from Latin and Greek, so. You know, all of that is uh, are related, but we actually um, uh, got one specimen here. Bear with me a minute, and I'll find it. We'll and I just like you. to tell for the people who are not following along in the chat, we've got uh, one of our participants is interested in identifying which type of periodical cicada they have, and so through our okay. museum specimens as well, I think that we can show a couple of the varieties of periodicals and how yeah. you can compare um, which, which version you have if you don't have a chart of when they emerged. 
And you were saying it reminds you of percussion that instruments do. So Larry was saying the males, their abdomen is hollow. Um, so it, it amplifies the sound a lot, but it's related to percussion. They call them bands when they're all singing. Uh, it's, it's often referred to that as that. But it's, oh, here's your picture. So uh, um, you have a Cassini. You um, have a Cassini. If you, if you don't mind, uh, Kelly, may I spotlight you so that other people can see the specimen that you've just held up? Right. Yeah. So I'm going to just, this is the uh, specimen oh, yeah. that has just been identified live on camera by <laughs> our volunteers. Yeah, Very it's Magic cool. Cicada. Magic Cicada Cassini, right, Mo? Oh, he looks so, yeah, yeah. That is excellent. And oh, yeah. nice. <laughs> we've got some cicada shirts <laughs> going on. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'm the bug um, guy. So. And we've got Larry's bug shirts. You know, it is, it is a lot of that's not a, that's not a cicada, though. That's a cockroach. Yeah, you know, we, we're equal opportunity in our, that's in our okay. bug life. Yeah. yeah, excellent. Very so good. So, yeah, what are the other specimens that we'd like to share today? Well, you have specimens from all over the world. So when we were talking how the, the annual cicadas are really large and the periodicals are rather small, um, there's even tinier ones. Larry, do you have the little tiny guy? <laughs> These are my yeah, favorites. Yeah. <laughs> I love the little tiny insects because they're often overlooked. And But when you look at them, they're, they're just astounding. So it's really okay, neat to have little tiny. I'll tiny switch specimens. over to the camera again and show you this little guy. Ooh. Look how tiny. That's so I mean, small. Compared yeah, you wouldn't, when you see them out in the, the field, you wouldn't even notice. Cicada. Now, hang on a second here. This is we'll just let me on focus the, in for you. The focus coming in. And this guy is from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have guy. tiny ones here in North America. One of the smallest uh, species out there. That's from the Philippines, the very, very small one. From the Philippines. And then we've got um, some of the larger ones. This guy is from Malaysia. Whoa, oh, gotta, we've got to zoom down for this one. Way out for that. What a yeah, radical right. size difference. There we go. Let me put them in here. So that's a board of styrofoam. And that's um, uh, one of the tools of the trade for, yeah. How, yeah. What, why are all these? Love styrofoam. <laughs> They're called ward containers, ward, bo ward boxes. We keep them all in there. But that guy is. Um, from Malaysia. This one is from Ecuador. Oh, that's pretty. That's spotted like a, like a moth that I've seen. Yeah, they call them hieroglyphics because they're yeah. winged. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So Larry was saying about the biology. So if you notice, the annual cicadas are really large. One of the reasons the periodical cicadas that we have in this area are so small is because so Larry was talking about the biology. So every 17 years they come out, they lay their eggs. They lay their eggs, the females lay their eggs in slits in the bark, it's almost like a, like a saw. So they kind of slide the ovipositor under the bark and they lay a series of eggs. Some females aren't as smart as others and they end up laying them all on the edge and it can actually be called flagging. And you'll see that some branches are kind of dead. Females can actually cause just a little bit of damage. They're not known to cause extreme damage to any trees or shrubs or anything in your yard. It's fine. But they do tend to kill the edge of branches sometimes. But the females lay their eggs. And then when the nymphs hatch, even from far up, the nymphs are clear. They're um, like opaque. They're really, really fragile. They hadn't hardened yet. And they just fall to the ground. I mean, sometimes 10, 20 feet. And they just fall and you just hope for the best. Um, and they burrow their way underground to the root system and where they drink on the roots for 13 to 17 years. But the reason they're so small and it takes so long, scientists believe, is that they're just not getting enough nutrition. Um, it'd be like just feeding your child McDonald's for the rest of their lives, as opposed to feeding them meat and potatoes. They're obviously not going to do as well and be as large as somebody who gets protein and vegetables. So that's one of the reasons it takes so long for these cicadas to come out. And they theorize that they come out in 13 to 17 years based one climate, but two, because it evades predators, which is a really amazing thing. So 
they come out in prime number years, which mathematicians figured out, way better people at math than I am figured out. And the reason they theorize that they come out on these scales is because it avoids predators. Um, you can't have predators figure out your cycle every 15 years or whatever, because there's animals that will be on that cycle. So if you breed every three years or every five years or every six years, things will figure out birds are smart enough that they can tell generations later, hey, in a couple of years, there's gonna be this massive food source for you. It's kind of like winning the lottery when you're trying to have babies. There's just an abundant food source. But to keep people and predators from taking advantage of that, they develop this system where they emerge where predators can't take advantage of it, except for one little fungus, um, which Larry will talk about, which is a really, really cool thing. So stick around for that. because It's an amazing little thing about these cicadas. Um, we are probably not going to see any in this area. Unfortunately, there was an extinct um, on Long Island. There was a bunch of populations about 17 years ago. They kind of died out and people don't know if they're still there. They think because of development, um, pesticide use, habitat loss, there's a lot more streets being built. So concrete paves over it. Um, when I went to Virginia to my friend Donnie's house, um, I have pictures, but his house has two of the oldest trees in the whole neighborhood. I mean, the entire block, um, blocks and blocks of houses. And his was the only yard that had these 17 year cicadas. So 17 years ago when I was there, they were everywhere. But just because of housing developments, they're not there anymore. They have populations that go back to 1694 is the earliest recorded date of watching a brood of these emerge. Um, there's extinct populations that we know about. But a really cool thing now is that you can track cicada sightings. So there's a cicada app called Cicada Safari. Just learn that, going to download it. Um, where you can submit your pictures and they'll let you know if in fact it is a cicada, an imaginata cicada, a bat, and you can keep track of it. And it actually is really, really important for scientists. So if you happen to be able to download this app, it's really important, and you can go out and find cicadas, but it helps us keep track of brood maps. So although there's habitat loss and we're losing some of the broods that historically we've known about, we're actually learning about other broods because everyone has smartphones. So you can take a camera out into the woods, you can have GPS, it'll work wherever you go. So the fact that people have iPhones and can take pictures is actually really helping scientists locate, hopefully new populations and new broods. So yes. yeah, that mapping and, and the ability for really anyone that can download the app to participate in citizen science in that way is tremendous for data collection, especially when you're talking about range maps, and where, um, yeah, I was gonna say range maps and then things that are related to range maps. So distribution, uh, timing of when they've emerged, having images, and there are, even if cicadas are not your thing, there are other citizen science projects for really any type of species that you're interested in tracking. Um, there is, I know there's a ladybug project and a bumblebee project for the same thing. Yeah, it's it's really neat to see all the populations. I My friend in Virginia, I, saw, I mean, he has these two trees and they're obviously, a habitat for the 17 year cicadas. So I told him if he ever sells his house, I wanna make sure I get his house so I can protect these 17 year cicadas at all costs. So, cause they're the only, I mean, I drove around for three hours and they were the only ones that I found within a three hour drive. So it's really important that we maintain it. So hopefully it survives for another 17 years. Yeah, and it's that um, habitat preservation or allowing things like snags to remain on your property. They can be homes for all sorts of animals, but also, yeah, you don't know if you have a cicada pocket underneath your tree. No, um, he didn't know. It takes a long time to <laughs> he was find quite out surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was good for me. So it was nice. It that was, was nice. Excellent. So I can switch my spotlight back over to Larry here. I'm going to take myself out. Do you want to talk about the fungus, Larry? Yeah, the um, everybody loves the fungus. Yeah, Mo uh, mentioned about this fungus. Now I don't know if you've ever heard the term of a zombie cicada. Uh, that that's pretty much what what happens here. And you know, right now there's probably about there's over thirty four thousand different species of of cicadas that have been identified, with you know more and more being found every year. And uh, but it was it's just the uh, the periodical the major cicada genus that gets this particular fungus. 
And what happens is the, um, uh, and I've got some pictures of it too. So rather than looking at me, let's look at the fungus instead. That's better, that's more interesting. Let me zoom in on this. And what happens is, maybe you can see that little white spot on its abdomen um, here. That's a normal um, abdomen right here, typical one. This, this guy right here, and it's usually the males that get uh, infected. And it's the weirdest thing. I mean, you know, you talk about nature and, and, and how different species and, and, and things just keep on evolving and, and continue living. This particular fungus, and this is called Massospora, Cas uh, uh, um, uh, Cicadini, I'm sorry, and uh, uh, it it's what it does. It it it, it infects the male uh, of the of, of the species, eats away at its abdomen. Yet it still continues living. It eats away at its abdomen, and what happens is this particular fungus causes the males who normally sing to attract the females, it actually causes the males to give up their, uh, you know, males uh, uh, singing and to switch over and flick their wings like females do. When, when the females hear the, cicada, uh, the male cicadas and they wanna mate, the females will, will click their wings together. Well, what happens here is that the, um, the males will start doing the same thing. So what does that do? That will attract other males to the male that's infected with the fungus. And, and that in turn helps transmit the pretty, you know, most scientists think that that's how it transmits uh, primarily, uh, you know, from one generation to the other. And uh, it will cause uh, other males to get infected then. I mean, it's just, it's just totally amazing that it, it, it can cause a male cicada to act like a female to attract other males that that fungus can infect. I mean, it's amazing. That is a very clever mechanism. On the oh, absolutely, fungus. absolutely. And it can't, it doesn't affect females. So when the males, right. when their, their abdomen is hollow for their percussion, it's ideal for this fungus. So the fungus actually takes over and eats out their entire inside of their abdomen. Um, so that's when you see Mary's picture right there, when you see the fungus hanging out, that's actually taken over the entire abdomen. So females, they're so juicy and plump because they're meant to have babies. So they have too much stuff inside of them. The fungus doesn't adhere to them as well. So um, it's a really neat kind of thing. So it's, it's kind of like an STD in the insect world, um, but the fungus, it, it almost looks like dirt or dust on them. And when they fly over those spores spread everywhere, so they've kind of earned the nickname of salt shakers of death um, because they just fly over and they just spread the spores everywhere. So <laughs> it's not good if you're a male cicada and this, but, and this fungus is around, but this is the only thing, this is the only organism at all that they found um, that's able to bypass all the prime brood emergences. So this fungus will stay in the soil for 17 years and it'll stay dormant until those cicadas rub up against it as they emerge out of the soil. Um, and it's the only thing that gets them. So, and so when we have the 13 year and the 17 years, although these numbers are so high, sometimes you'll have the 17 years emerge at 13 years or vice versa, the 13 will emerge at 17 years. And they think it's kind of, you can avoid the fungus, but it's also a timing thing. They think sometimes the broods break off if you have too high of populations or the tree's not doing well, or something's not doing well, they can actually break off and they'll emerge at different years and they'll start new broods, which is why we have so many different broods. But that's why, yeah. But one other thing here too is, um, if anybody's interested here, we have male and female cicadas. And here's the difference. I mean, it's, it's, fair, it's relatively easy to tell cicadas the sexes because they're, well, they're large. First of all, you don't have to get them under a microscope. Uh, secondly, the um, um, the male is this guy right here. Okay, 
typically they'll have a, a more rounded abdomen. And like, you know, we said before, it's very hollow. And the, the female, I don't know if you can see it that well, but there's the organ called the ovipositor right there. That is the device that uh, she uses to deposit her eggs in, you know, young branches uh, on trees. I think, Mo, I think you were saying that, you know, it, it you know, they, they infest trees like that, but they really don't do any major damage to them at all. Not really. And, um, um, but that's what she uses to deposit the eggs. Very and then pointy. after these guys <laughs> mate, you know, like I said, they'll, they'll live on for a while providing food for, I mean, there, there probably isn't any animal around that doesn't eat it, including humans. And um, I don't know if anybody's ever tried cicadas before, but um, we haven't only because the- um, No. <laughs> they're, they're, yeah, they're kind of, they're kind of, you don't want to make, you know, you can go online and you can find recipes for cicadas, but it's not a good idea to go out in your backyard and, and pick them up because, you know, you pick up pesticides, you know, you never know what else is around there. Uh, but I do understand there's a couple of places uh, available that will actually farm uh, the cicadas for you and, you know, rear them in, um, you know, a clean, a clean environment, no pesticides, stuff like that. And uh, you can buy them and make uh, whatever you want. But the only thing is, if you're allergic to shellfish, you don't want to eat cicadas. Oh, interesting. Do cicadas have iodine in them? They're related. So it's, um, if you actually eat cicadas, people say they taste like shrimp. Um, so their exoskeleton is made of, of the same thing. So some, they say sometimes if you have an allergic reaction um, to shrimp or lobster or something like that, cicadas probably aren't good for you. <laughs> there is, not, it might be the iodine, but there's definitely something it's not, it's not good. They also, there's a group of scientists that track them. Um, cicadas absorb mercury um, while they're underground. So that's another big reason you shouldn't go and just scoop them up and eat them. Um, they're fine for pets and things like that. So I know a lot of, there's a lot of concerns of whether or not they'll hurt my pets or my children. They absolutely will not. Um, they're completely safe. The only issue cats or dogs might have is if they eat too many, sometimes they can choke, but it's just like food, you know, most of the dogs and cats are careful about it, but that's the only risk. There's, there's really nothing else. Kind of dogs like them as treats. I've seen a lot of owners with videos where their dogs go out and they haven't had to feed their dogs for a week because they just go out and just eat cicadas the entire time. So they don't, they're not going to cause indigestion or, you know, they're not going to bite. Um, so there's an urban myth that cicadas don't actually eat when they're adults, but that's actually false. So they do have a straw like mouth part. They just eat very, very, very little. It's nothing that's going to damage a tree and people hardly ever see them eating. So I'm sure that's where it got started, but um, adult cicadas do in fact actually eat. So that's something that people should know. <laughs> and just before we move on from the uh, consumption of cicadas, I thought in our preparations, it was fascinating to hear, to make the connection that you made that the USDA can't regulate cicadas because of the way that they grow. They grow underground and you can't monitor them and they are essentially wild forage, except um, in, in these cases that Larry had mentioned, which is interesting to see what the USDA's position is on um, cicada farming, because I know they regulate butterflies. If you go to the fair and you go into the butterfly tent, the USDA regulates all of the butterflies that are released in there. You can't take them with you from those tents because again, they're, they're very rigorously tracked. Um, and it's just fascinating, fascinating the overlap between um, agricultural uh, regulations and cicada emergence. I think it would be really expensive um, as well. So like, say you're growing crickets, so people eat crickets for flour, pizza or whatever. Um, so if you're growing crickets, they're very cost efficient. So you can set them up on a table. I mean, a 10 by 10 table and I can grow enough crickets to feed a family of five. Um, cicadas are underground for 17 years. <laughs> so having to maintain that, um, I took care of beetles that required a year full of extensive Hair, um, for a full year to get them from this to development. It was a team of six of us. It was around the clock care. It was incredibly expensive. Um, I can't imagine how much a cicada pizza would cost if you had to wait 17 years for them <laughs> to, to come up. It would you be can, very expensive, I'm sure. 
You can eat the annual cicadas too, but. Yeah, people eat the grubs. I've seen um, recipes yeah. for saute. So Larry and I were talking about this. We're like, how would you actually eat it? Like, do you take off the wings? Like, what do you kind of do? But um, there's um, videos where they just cook the nymphs. So they're really soft. Um, and they actually, people talk about how they soak up the sauces and they're really good. I've heard them compared to tofu as far as soaking up ingredients and tasting really good. Um, more power to you. It's just not my fancy, but yeah, I know people really recommend like them. That anyone, uh, if you're interested in eating bugs, there are some safe and effective ways of procuring. 100%. Um, and so just be mindful of the things that you put into your body, um, especially around here in Buffalo, where our soils are uh, questionable is a nice term for some of the areas. So just be very mindful of the things that come out of the ground um, and the other materials that we put into the ground that also come out. My favorite thing, I know we're talking about bugs and what they absorb, but a really, really the coolest fact that I learned about cicadas is that they actually have the first biomaterial that kills bacteria that was ever found. So um, if you've ever, because I was collecting in the pouring rain, um, I noticed that they weren't getting wet and you can pick them up and they're, it's, it's like picking up a duck, the water just rolls right off of them. Um, but I learned that they have these little nano cones on their wings. So it's kind of like spikes. Like if you put the, we're all in Buffalo, so we know about snow roofs. So when you put the spikes on their wings, um, water, when it hits them, it just washes everything off. Because of that, no bacteria can stick to it. And if any bacteria gets on the wings, the little nanotech particles and the cones literally shred the bacteria. So it, it sliced into little tiny itty bitty pieces before it can even adhere to the wing. So I just thought that was amazing. So they discovered that not too long ago. So. These little cicadas are incredibly important. Um, they're using that technology to develop military wear for soldiers. So it's it's really fascinating. So neat bug stuff. Just one other thing here. Uh, Gabrielle, I don't know when you want to start taking questions of that, but um, one thing I want to show you here is, let me switch back over here. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen these, if you been outside and seen cicadas, sometimes you'll see their wings aren't fully formed. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, a lot of times, either they'll, they may die before their wings fully develop, but when they emerge out of their um, casing, for use of a simpler term, I don't know if you've ever seen these, these are, that's what's called the exuvia. When, when a, um, uh, a cicada emerges out of the ground, it comes up, it, it breaks out of its case like this. You can see that split right down the middle. It just inches up from that. In fact, we even have, we've got a specimen here where you can see it's partly out of its casing. And let me put it at an angle, you might see it better. But you can see the wings aren't fully developed yet. In the nymphal stage, this is just coming out of its case. And what they do is, as they, you know, in order to develop properly, they have to climb up trees. And ideally, they'll be uh, straight up on the trees with their head facing toward the branches and their tail end toward the roots. And what happens is, as they're maturing, that, that position helps the uh, liquid, the fluids in their body to fill in on their wings, fill them up so that they um, uh, uh, develop properly. A lot of times that doesn't happen. Um, sometimes they may be facing the other direction. You know, and when you got billions of other cicadas running around trying to do the same thing that you're trying to do, you know, they, they, they'll climb on top of you and, you know, it, it, it messes up that whole process. So that's, um, that's what they look like if you ever see a cicada with that. It's not, you know, a mutant form of it. It's just <laughs> it developed its uh, wings properly. Um, I just noticed a question that had skipped by me. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, Spenta and our matey, I'm so sorry uh, if I have butchered your names and I feel that I have and I apologize. 
Uh, they are from Canada, north of Toronto, and they are they have some shad flies around that sound and do the same thing like cicadas. Uh, they wanted to know if they are related. They, they have fun? Shad flies, S-H-A-D-F-L-Y. I think it might be related to a mayfly. Um, Never heard of that term. They before. emerge for about two weeks um, during the summer oh. and every morning street sweepers have to clean the streets and you have to wipe Mayflies. Down or is it like a mayfly? It's like, mayflies. They are not related. Mayflies oh, are different. Um, they're they're flies. Um, no, they're completely different. But those emerge in huge numbers as well. That's a climate control as well. So I think it's after the rain or at certain temperatures. Um, they emerge all at once and they only live for a few days. And I don't know if it's not brutes like this. Um, the emergences, as far as my understanding, is it's based on temperatures. Um, so when you have really, really, really good conditions, they'll all emerge at once. Um, the emergence is good for fish and birds and all that stuff, um, but they're emerging to find mates. So it's kind of like going to a bar on a Friday night. You have more chances going on a Friday than you do on a Monday. So they just all want to hang out together on Fridays. But um, because of habitat loss and all sorts of issues like that, pesticides, um, there's not enough fish to eat large numbers of them anymore. So you find them getting in lights, they get near cars, they get near houses. They're completely harmless. They don't even feed. So adults don't even feed, but um, they're a little annoying. They can make the car, like the street slippery and stuff, but mayflies, they shouldn't really bother you. Yeah, and the cool thing about cicadas, I'm so sorry, I forgot. Um, so like the mayflies, when they all merge from climate control, cicadas, I think it has to be 63 degrees. 63 degrees for three or four days in a row for them to emerge and they'll poke their little heads up. And I, I mean, I can't tell what temperature it is living in Buffalo, New York from one day to the next, but they seem to know. And it's amazing that these insects have been underground for 17 years and they can tell the temperature. And if it's 63, 63, and then like 61, they, it, it doesn't work. So you have to wait. So sometimes when the temperature doesn't work, you can lift up rocks or something and there'll just be thousands and thousands of little holes and little tiny cicada heads because they're just they're waiting for that friday night and it's just the temperature is just not cooperating so it's neat that that insects are able to tell temperature way better than i ever could so it's neat it's very cool uh, we also have a question from maddie uh maddie if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question Oh, we gotta, I'm not sure how to turn no, it. We can hear you. That's okay. You. Okay. We just wanted to show you a, um, a shell that we found. It's a little See if blurry. That's really... I'm going to add a spotlight to your video. There we go. Yep. That is very tiny. I can't tell what it is. <laughs> I know. It, actually, I can't. If I could figure out how to turn my camera around. Maddie, maybe you can figure out. A... Can you hold it up? Pick it up. Hold on one minute. How do we? Because oh, now I, I see. have to know. Hold on one minute. <laughs> Sorry. This about is that. The, the science museum is a place of answers, and we will. I mean, I, I think we're all peering really intently at our screens to see what it is that you've got. <laughs> I know. Are. I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure it out. Oh no, no are problem. You oh, are you local? Oh, I think it's a spear shell. That looks like a ship. Yeah, we are I think local. We are. Yeah. We are up on the ridge, Chestnut Ridge. Chestnut Ridge. Okay. Oh, nice. Hmm. I'm not that's sure. Okay, probably... let me see. Maybe if I'm... Oh, yeah. Hold it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a cicada shell. Yeah, but you know, that that's probably, it's not from the uh, recent brood. It's not the uh, brood. No, it's an bed. annual. Yeah. It's an annual cicada. Probably, it's probably left over from last year. And, oh, um, okay. you know, because those are called, the ones we have up here in the Buffalo, Western New York area, uh, they're um, called the dog day. Uh, uh, cicadas because they typically come out in the hot days of August and uh, that's probably from last year. And they're bigger. They're bigger. That one looks bigger. So I know I know it's weird but um, Magic Cicadas, they have tiny molts and I know that one only looks a little bit bigger but a little bit bigger molt makes a much bigger cicada. So I would assume and plus if you only found one that's a big indication that it's probably an annual cicada because the periodicals, they'll just they'll come out in number. Even if it's not this brood, um, they'll still come out in large enough numbers that within a couple of feet, you'll find 10 or 20, almost hands down. 
Yeah, and that's a big cool. one, so I would assume that it's a dog-based data. Oh, um, okay, cool, thanks. Larry, somebody asked um, how they dig underground. Can you show a close picture? Are you able to get a close up oh, of the, the larva? Can't hear you. He'd like, uh, can you so, show the digging claws on the larva? On that bolt? Oh, yeah, sure. Excellent. So somebody was asking how these little tiny nymphs get all the way down in the dirt. They just dig. They have super, super tough. It's almost like crab claws. Like they're that big and they're that tough for this little tiny insect. So they just dig and they're incredibly, incredibly strong. Um, even the molts, hopefully what, we'll, yep. Even the molts, if you look, the front legs are like the toughest, toughest of the exoskeleton. If you get that and you crush it, um, it'll kind of be like paper thin, almost like tissue paper. They just crumble right up. Um, the front legs will will survive that. They're you can't crush them. They're incredibly, incredibly strong. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the um, see the uh, claws on the the front claws of that guy, but it's they're pretty pretty gnarly for just a little guy like this. They really do look like crustacean claws. They yeah. do. They do. Yeah. Yeah. They do. And they're hard. I mean, if you look at them up super, super up close, they're, I mean, they're just made for digging. They're just really, really strong. So even uh, looking at that now, um, I can see light passing through the rest of the molt, but I don't feel like I can see light passing through those claws. Are they solid? They're, it's not, they're not solid. They're just that strong. So they're, it's just super, super, super thick. Yeah, and if you look at them, kind of, they almost look like they're dipped in black paint, but it, they're just that thick. They're just that thick that the chitin is just that much thicker there. It's just like a crab, like the, the claws are usually thicker than the shell. It's the, it's the same premise. Yeah, they're just super, super strong. They're amazing. Love we, little We have another question. Um, Carly says, hi, thank you for holding this talk. If I want to attract more of the annual cicadas to my space, are there specific trees I should plant or conditions I, sh I should set up? Uh, always hope for some, but never seem to get them. So is there anything that you can do in terms of like native habitat planting or how do you create a cicada friendly environment? Um, they, I know they're on oaks, um, trees similar to that. I'm horrible with plants. It's literally <laughs> my, my entomology downfall. I'm atrocious with plants. Um, that's why my mom's a botanist and I love her to pieces for it. Um, I know that they're on oaks. Um, they just take a really, really long time to mature. Um, I'm not even sure about native plants in New York. Unfortunately, I'm not from here. I apologize. Um, Larry, you've been here more. You might know more about yeah, that. There's, there's, there's nothing in particular. They don't need a specific um, uh, environment. I mean, they're pretty much anywhere. You know, you'll find them. And they fly. Uh, You'll, yeah, exactly. You'll find them uh, in, in, in city streets. You'll find them out in rural areas. Uh, it, it really doesn't. Just nothing, don't cut down know, trees. Nothing that particular. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Keep the really big homestead trees. Those are, they're perfect. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, they like for trees, large but... moths, the silk moths, um, for, for everything. So the really good trees. We should keep those for everything. And the and the um, the annual cicadas, they don't cause any damage to your trees either. Um, even though they're larger, um, even if they were in a little bit more higher numbers, it's it's not going to damage any of your plants. Um, like I said, I would love to buy my friend's house because I know that in 17 years I'm going to walk outside and there's going to be more cicadas. Um, but just just plant hardwood trees. So that's definitely we need more of them for all insects, actually. So. Yes, definitely. I can't recommend enough uh, planting trees, planting trees woody, yeah. woody shrubs. Trees are great to help uh, shade you from the heat of the sun, which is certainly something that we're feeling these days here in Buffalo. Um, but yeah, just getting some mature landscaping around. Um, just let your things grow. Oh, we've got another question. What do they eat when they emerge? And are there any predators at all? Like do, are birds feasting on cicadas? Oh yeah, they, they don't eat a lot, but they, they have a straw mouth part. It's why they're hemipterans. Um, so they have a straw like mouth part that they insert into the tree bark. Um, they eat like the loam and the xylem, just a little tiny bit, the tiny, like a little tiny pink every, every bit. Um, birds love them. <laughs> Birds absolutely feast on them. It's one of the reasons when I was saying like the 13 years and the 17 years to discourage predators from learning when they emerge to eat them all. 
Um, but when they do emerge, it's it's pretty amazing. I've heard stories where people have heard um, squirrels have been so fat. They're literally just under trees, just sitting there so fat they can't move. Um, I've got reports that dogs eat them all the time. Cats love them. Um, rodents eat them. Sometimes there's been a little bit higher rodent population um, just because they were fed so well on cicadas. Um, but birds absolutely love them, 100%. Yeah, yeah, when I was actually collecting them, there were birds on the fence watching. <laughs> and they were waiting, so I would leave, they would try to come down and get one and then go back over. So they definitely like them. Yeah, there is, uh, there's pretty much no, nothing out there that won't eat them, you know, including humans. Um, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of cultures, especially in the uh, uh, East, uh, Eastern Asia, that they're, they're great sources of protein and uh, they've, you know, they're fine. You know? Stir fries, pizzas, cookies. Yeah. Um, you can grind them up. People make them into flour. Yeah. They, yeah. I mean, you can eat them in anything. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of really cost effective protein in the faster growing insects. I, yeah. I taught a class on eating insects and it's, it's definitely beneficial. hundred uh, percent. We have a couple other questions in the chat and I do want to get to those. We're coming in the last 10 minutes of our program now. Um, as someone who took the wrong path in life and is a third of their way to retirement, is it too late in my life to start over and go to school for entomology? No. <laughs> Are you aware of, um, so they took a Bugs 101 on Coursera from the University of Alberta. Are you aware of other opportunities to advance my knowledge of insects here locally or are there opportunities to be mentored in insect related activities? Come and talk to me. <laughs> um, I don't know a lot of around here. I was trained um, in Missoula, Montana, so at the University of Montana, and then I've worked at a couple independent research labs, um, stuff like that, but it's never too late. Absolutely not. No, you have to go. I think entomology is one of the best professions. I think it's a great field, um, great people. No, absolutely go. Um, there's forestry schools, I think, that do a little bit more into entomology. I don't know of anything at the state but I know that Cornell is not too far. Um, and they, Cornell has one of the best entomology programs on the East Coast. And they have extensions out here. I know there's some um, by Erie, Pennsylvania, things like that. They work a lot with, um, because New York is huge in agriculture, obviously. Um, but Cornell Extension does considerable amount of work. The USDA, I worked for them for a very long time. Um, you don't really need that much experience. And you can go in and they have entomology programs as well. Don't, don't forget about forensic entomology too. Huge, yeah, huge. Yes. That's, that's what I'm trained in. Yeah. That, that's amazing how they can, you know, tell how long a body has been, you know, dead we just did. by yeah. the stage and what type of insect is, you know, infected it. So I think the Cornell extension is a great place for looking for some additional um, self-directed research. Yeah, um, I know there's a USDA in Tonawanda, I believe. Um, they're phenomenal. They're, they're amazing. They'll, they'll help you. They're really good. Um, I don't know. I know where I used to live. They had the USD had public outreach courses. I'm sure they have them here. I just haven't looked into it, but um, they're incredibly helpful. They were super nice when I was looking into opportunities around here as well. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and then we have another question. How about how, so we, in Western New York, we remember the emerald boar ash. Disease. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would cicadas avoid those diseased trees or would they use them as a habitat still? Um, I don't, I'm not hundred percent if they infest ash. I know that ash, um, oddly enough, my boyfriend actually works in the Emerald Ash Borer Program. So that's how I met. He still owes me one, by the way. Um, I don't know, he's never, because he reports all bugs back to me. <laughs> so he's never had an issue with cicadas. I don't know if they infect ash, to be honest. Um, they would, so insects are phenomenal and they put out like bark beetles, bark beetles infest trees and bark beetles and trees can put out pheromones that tell other bark beetles that there's too many. If they lay eggs, um, their eggs won't survive because there won't be enough food. And trees do the same thing. They send off pheromones to tell other trees, you got to take some of these beetles, otherwise I'm not going to survive. Then what are you going to do? Um, I don't know if cicadas and trees communicate the same way. They're typically in one area. So I don't know of them with it, but I can definitely under look into it. I can let you know. Yeah. So if you um, let's see, that was I can just save your email and we will send you in, information later on. 
Thank yeah, you. I just found two EABs this weekend, the first ones I've ever found. So Excellent. they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, so, like the brown enumerated got... stink bugs. They're everywhere. I know, yeah. stink bugs, brown enumerated. Everybody's, everybody's seen those. They're a pest, just almost as worse than the emerald ash borer. But yeah. they don't do damage, though. For sure. Stink bugs. They do stink. So we've got uh, four more minutes. If anyone else has any questions that they would like to ask, or if anyone else has a specimen, I'm so pleased to see that people showed up to our conversations. And I love bug with IDs. Their items, yeah. And there are some great apps yeah, thank you so um, much. for bug identification as well. Um, and yeah, if you want to just for. email me or uh, contact the museum, uh, my email is gram at sciencebuff.org. And um, I can relay any questions that you want to send now or whenever um, to the experts that we have on our uh, block of volunteers and our facilitators that are here. And we just we just love bugs. Bugs are so cool. Um, I do have a few things. So uh, any tips on bug photography? What types of lenses work best? I would say. Um, the Science Museum <laughs> Camera Club is one of our affiliates, and they yep. are have been having meetings on the first and third Wednesdays. And so check out the Science Museum Camera Club, and they have done special units on bug photography. Actually, they've borrowed some bugs from our collection to practice bug photography in the past. Um, and I will put a link in there as well. Yeah, I use microscopes. I'm so sorry. I don't know anything about photography. I wish. I'm just pulling up some links here. And we shall, ours should be emerging soon. They should be emerging like July, end of July. So we should still see some here. Fantastic. We're getting a lot of thank yous. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're so welcome. Our, our well, we really appreciate appreciate the amount of people that signed up for this. That was uh, thank you so much for you know, cicadas showing an interest in it. Um, to carry, yes, um, all insects are on a decline. Um, huge, actually. A recent study just came out, and they said in the last couple of years, it's like a thirty three percent reduction, like in less than ten years. It's it's a phenomenal, phenomenal rate. Um, that they're declining. Um, cicadas, I don't know about annual cicadas, I'm assuming since we're declining in everything, but um, the periodical cicadas, it's not that they're declining so much, it's that we're losing entire populations. Um, they have entire populations that have completely gone extinct. There are no more of them in those locations anymore. Um, so unfortunately, but it's habitat loss to start. We pave over a ton. People want to do their yards and rip out old trees. Um, it completely destroys their habitat. They can't, it's not like the nymphs can move. They need that tree. Um, once you rip out trees, the entire population just dies. So unfortunately. Excellent. Um, so I am going to bring us to an official close. It brings us to the official end of our program. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate Mo and Larry taking their time and sharing their passion and their expertise. Um, everyone can stay up to date on the Conversations in Science series by looking at our website, and I'll include a link here. We also have um, a survey for uh, getting some feedback from you all. And if I haven't just deleted that link from my, oh, there it is. Okay, great. Um, so feedback is extremely important to us uh, and our ability to meet our mission. If you enjoyed this program or you're looking for other programs that are similar to this, uh, we would love to just get your two minute feedback um, through that survey monkey link. Um, and with that, we just, I'll leave it open for a little bit if anyone needs to grab links out of the chat, but thank you so much for being here. Mo, you are a wealth of information, and <laughs> Virginia are amazing. Uh, Larry, you really nailed those camera handling skills for being the first time that you spent a long time uh, presenting on this. That was very admirable as someone that uses that setup a lot. So good job, and we're definitely going to ask you back for some other things. No problem, anytime.
So thank you all again. Uh, my name is Gabrielle Graham. I'm the Community Partnerships and Adult Programs Manager for the Buffalo Museum of Science. You can always reach me at G-G-R-A-H-A-M at sciencebuff, S-C-I-E-N-C-E-B-U-F-F dot O-R-G. Um, and thank you to our friends in Canada for signing in. And thank you for everyone on the meeting today. It has just really been a pleasure. Thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Awesome. Yes, bye. Cool.